Reality is perception of reality. Because maybe you look at it from your own meaning, your own background, your own past experiences, and I look at it from my own, and we're looking at the same thing. And then the I only has 10% of that reality because the rest is in the rest of our brain and it's perceived in different ways. So how do we know that this is square, this is flat, this is 3D? A great example is a picture. When you judge a picture and then they show you the picture, the other side of it, and then you see the other reality, you're like, oops, you were already judging this. But then there's always another angle. There's two, three, four sides of the same story. And it just depends on which angle you look at it from. So it's hard sometimes to be so neutral and so objective because of course things happen to us and we feel, right? But what I've learned lately is that when you step out and if you're going to judge or you're going to try to make an analysis, if you come out from a place of love, then the understanding and what comes out is much different than when you're just reacting. And that ability to act as an observer and analyze a bit more comes from that inner peace that comes from being a lot inside of yourself so that the rest of the day you are able to go about your life but still acting as if you were this observer versus reacting towards things that happen. You can still be yourself, have that essence, however your personality comes about, be yourself, but with this observer mode. Welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. This show is for entrepreneurs. They have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Moon. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary, challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to another episode of The Awakening Entrepreneur. Today, we've got a very special guest, uh, one of us, a dear sister of mine, all the way from Cancun, Mexico. She's like a world traveler and a successful female entrepreneur, a powerhouse. She's been hanging around the likes of Richard Branson, Tony Robbins, Wim Hof, learning from all these great master plus more. She's inspired many. She's a philanthropist. She's a mother and she's a awakened soul. So for many years, she's someone that works on building business and started from a ground up with literally nothing, never been called to be an entrepreneur, but somehow stumbled away, got awakened to be an entrepreneur. And then from there, the journey just success upon success and in the modern day if we looked at life that would fill us up but like just as jim carrey and a lot of the working entrepreneur that has come on the show with the test to it money is the illusion that will give us happiness success is the illusion that will fill us up unless the inner peace inner joy is the inner beauty is awakened and is fully alive there's always something missing and erica is starting to find that and she's our special guest today so welcome erica garcia thank you so much gary muchas gracias thank you so much it is an honor to be here so you've come basically you've studied in the u.s and you went back to mexico so just tell us a bit about how did your business career started your entrepreneurial career started my business career started uh when i was a lot older than most millennials that are starting or, or centennials it was by accident it was a crisis of September 11 that was very unfortunate. But in our country, in Mexico, in the Mexican region, in the Mexican Caribbean, 80% of the tourists that came to Mexico and the main market 
uh, was the American market. So when that unfortunate event came, they were not able to respond emotionally and want to go on vacation or travel, of course, because of what was happening. The Europeans were a lot more capable and resilient in terms of adapting to certain acts of terrorism, etc., because they were so close. So that shocked the world and it shocked us as a destination because we took for granted the American market. And as an entrepreneur, now I know you never take for granted any market. It doesn't matter which one it is. You need to find diversity within your own niche market. So we realized that as a destination that was very young, and by the way, Cancun is barely 50 years old. It's this year that's celebrating 50 years old. So it was a destination that was built on purpose for tourism. So here we were, and I was working in tourism, always in the sales level, and I couldn't understand why resort owners that invested money, that had to pay taxes, that created jobs, would sit there and wait to see, hopefully, if a tourist, if a travel agency or a company would send them tourists. I said, how is it possible that you are the owners of the resorts and you don't control the market or you don't even control who you are going after? And that's when I realized that the empty room was the most expensive room and that you couldn't just sit and wait to see if a tour operator would be sending you clients or not. So I decided on my own that day that I was going to do something about it. Motivated first, because at that time, my husband was a owner of a resort, but at the same time, because I felt commitment towards the community and towards that destination that had already given me a beautiful son and that I had already fulfilled individual dreams of growth in terms of being a great executive in a paradise like the Mexican Caribbean. So I said, I need to do something about it. I don't know what. And what I did is, it's funny because when you have that intention, it's almost like synchronicity. Something happened. And then I came across a book that changed my life, which was called The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, Pulitzer Award winner. And this is a lot of years ago. My business has been going on for 18 years. Now it's going to be 19. And I read that book and it changed my life because it told me how call centers work. It told me who was behind 411. It told me what was happening in India, what was happening in Philippines, who was behind every call, who was behind the banks, who was behind. And I noted that there was another world. So I made the decision to go traveling and follow each place that the book said. So I was away for a month in India and I visited Bangalore, New Delhi, Makati, etc. And I went and I understood what it was. So tell me more about this book, like The World is Flat. It sounds like an interesting book. Like it talks about a lot of the conspiracy theories or what is the, oh, the book actually covers? No, this is an old book now. Yeah. Remember that? 20 years ago. This was a book that was an innovation because what Freeman was talking about is that the world was flat from the point of view of being connected and linear. So what he was saying is that behind that phone number of your Chase Bank, of your Wells Fargo, of your Bank of America, behind 411, there was a Filipino or there was a Hindu or there was a Latino that was answering behind that providing service which was outsourced by Nike, by companies, etc., to give you service. And it talked about the service behind the 800 numbers, behind everything. So I noticed that there was a sub world and it talked about voice IP, which nowadays it's nothing. But at that time, Vonash was barely coming out and 1-800-COLLECT was big. And people, when they would travel, they would call 1-800-COLLECT. It was the beginning of the 800 numbers when you you still used to go to a hotel and pay lots of money to make an outside call. So it was just something unconceivable. So I had to understand that there was something called voice IP, which was literally a box that had data and voice at the same time. And I learned that that box and connectivity had the capacity to create and adapt to software where that software had the ability to hunt calls and then distribute them at the same time 
to individuals, and then it had the capacity to distribute those inbound calls that came from an 800 number and then provide service to credit card owners, et cetera, 411, et cetera. So when I learned this sub world by physically going there and sitting there in Makati and sitting in Mangalore and looking at cities, because I said, oh my God, there's 500 people here. There's a thousand people here. And I remember I was, oh, I was in awe. And I said, and all these people are servicing. Then I said, what if they could sell? And then I started understanding out of that range of call centers, which had the ability to have campaigns for selling. And I realized that the ones that did, they were selling prepaid phone calls or prepaid calling cards. And that was the business back then. So I said, okay. So I proposed to one of them if they could test selling a holiday for the Mexican Caribbean. So I created the product. I tested it with them. This is, of course, when I came back from my trip and I started building this idea. And at the beginning, it was very hard because they said, well, it's easy to understand a calling card or the phone, but how am I going to transfer and get someone to put them in the picture of being in a holiday if I don't, I've never left this city. I don't know where it is. So I started learning and adapting to put them in the picture. So I started bringing videos of Cancun. I brought tequila. I brought physically. I mean, I went 13 times. <laughs> I brought it. I did a, a strategic alliance with them where we started paying them and so they could learn and they could understand and see what they were selling and paying them in tequilas tequila <laughs> uh, mexican set up as you should have seen the office i decorated as if it was mexico i really i was like i said they have to feel it touch it whatever i hired some wannabe mariachis in makati so that they could sing i mean i did crazy stuff so that they could understand and feel what they were selling and slowly it started working and I kept them and later and then I invested in Philippines. I still have that call center there. What I learned from that was that I was able to reach through technology, through innovation, using technology and innovation, but still having that human touch and that core message, I was able to prove back then to my first client, which was my now ex-husband, but still friend and partner and the board, I was able to prove to them that there was a way that we could control the future of the destination of Cancun by not sitting and depending on an outside team or an outside uh, group to bring you clients but having real partners and the power of collaboration, but controlled by you so that you could go without the middle person to that consume. That nowadays is the norm. Now everyone creates their own market. They reach directly. But back then, everything was through a middle person, through an official distributor, through a licensee, etc. Nowadays, things have changed. And that's how I became an entrepreneur by mistake, because it was a crisis, it was an idea, and the ability to take action, which is something that I learned through Tony Robbins, was what helped me to adapt it. Because if I would have read that book, but I would have said, oh, this is awesome, it would have just been potential power, right? But because I actually took action and I fully immersed in learning, I was able to then adapted and I became in my time here in Cancun disruptive because I was the first call center in my region and in Mexico that dedicated to go to the consumer that wasn't a middle person. I was not a OTA, an online travel agency, and my interest was not to partner with a lot of resorts. I wanted to commit to a few and be able to deliver to them the proper clients and the targeted clients, because that was the second uh, portion that I added value because what happened before was that the clients that would come, they didn't care because the travel agent didn't matter if they were bringing a spring breaker or they brought a family. And if you are a family resort, sometimes you want to enjoy your family and you don't necessarily want to be with a party kids next door. Maybe you want that niche to go elsewhere and that's okay. So I learned that our target was the families that were traveling and I learned how to target them and how to go to them. 
So Erica, it sounds like that you've accumulated a lot of business skill, business acumen, at the same time developed yourself along the journey. What's also interesting just before we started this podcast, we also talked about what has happened over the last six months. A lot of us, I guess, in this awakened journey, we started as hustlers, achievers, and, and go-getters, and, and efforts, and drive, and push, and, and always doing, and there's always more to do. And if we hit certain milestone, we celebrate success for two seconds, two minutes, two days, and then we move on to next bigger goal, bigger targets. But um, yeah, tell me about what the last six months has like, and how has that transformed you? The last six months have been not only an awakening of my soul, but it is a realization that the way that I conceive God is in me. And God, that oneness, however you conceive it, has nothing to do with religion. You can see God in nature. You can see God in the smile of, of a kid. You can see God just by understanding your body and the beautiful things that happen and that we always take for granted, like breathing, like the heart pumping, like so many things that we just took for granted. And what happened during these last six months was not only the world pandemia, but I realized that the real pandemia was the fear and the minds and the terrible mindset that world communities had. And I realized that if I stopped consuming mainstream media and I went to my sources, which are Mind Valley, Gaia, London Real, my alternative media sources, my Platt family, and the proper information, then I would be able to be aligned. And what I started realizing was that I was never really grateful for what I had achieved. And I don't mean achieved in terms of sales volumes or whatever. I, I mean what I had achieved, which was this girl that never dreamed of being an entrepreneur ends up with more than 500 employees as a woman in a Latino country that normally was macho based in a beautiful paradise like Cancun with a healthy son. And I was always running away from my home that I love and that I love to promote, but I really never enjoyed it. I was never here for the last seven years, 13 consecutive days, unless it was Christmas. So I sat there and I would say, oh, I think I'm going to move that from my wall. I started contemplating, oh, I cleaned. I never cook. I bought a Thermomix. I don't know if people know what that is, but it helps you cook. And I was like, woohoo. And now I make my own almond milk. I make, I'm like, woohoo. And people laugh and they're like, Erica, you are cooking? I said, yes. And I started breathing. So after coming from Poland, I said, okay, I'm going to practice every day. I started breathing, swimming. And I said, while everyone else is suffering and people are in lockdown, I have the privilege that even though I'm in lockdown, I'm in lockdown in the hotel zone in a beautiful beach. And even though I cannot sit in the beach because they wouldn't let us, I can go run in it go in the ocean, swallow some seawater, watch the sun rise, and then come running back to my lockdown and continue studying and being online and hear my podcast. And when I did that, I started realizing the more I did it, the more grateful I was for what I had, the more I breathed, the more I was able to be in the present moment. And the more I was able to enjoy what I was doing at that time, instead of being here eating, thinking of where I wanted to be tomorrow, I started saying, hmm, this tastes good. So in the simple things, you find that everything you seek, you already are. So I didn't wait. I remember that one of the things that I disliked the most of the slogans of this pre-pandemic or pandemic times was, when this is over, we will do this. When this is over, we will party. When this is over, we will be happy. And I said, bullshit. You could already do that now. You don't have to wait when this is over because then it becomes like anything else. Oh, when I marry, I will be happy. When I reach this, I will be happy. It's the same, it's the same ego that's telling you that you are not able to do it now because you have to wait. And I said, no, I'm doing it now. And it's been very interesting and the most enjoyable six months. I've enjoyed my house, my son, my city and the simple things and all those shoes, I really didn't need him. <laughs> 
Wow. So when you say that you started, God is in each one of us. It's in the smile of the child. It's in the sun. It's everywhere. Did you just one day kind of got that epiphany, or is it each day like through the quieted down and slowing down, and suddenly it just more and more of this realization, or or maybe you've already you always known, but this confirmation, this validation started just radiating throughout your body. Like like how was that?、Uh, how do you come to that realization? First of all, I started questioning openly because I was raised Catholic, and you were not allowed to question. You were already feeling guilty by being born. You were already feeling guilty because Eve ate the apple, and it depended on who you would go to church with. Then the priest would interpret it different. And for many years, I went to different churches because I was seeking something. So I went to Presbyterian Christian church, and all of them, I got something beautiful out. But what I realized is that. Every single religion and every single dogma—it doesn't matter who the leader is or what's going on—claims that that is the only and absolute truth. So what I started questioning was that there is no such thing as an absolute truth, and I started understanding that ser humano, which is human being, is bifasico, right? So we are dual. We always have a dual. Right, two eyes, two noses, two ears. We have our system. Everything is dual. So we are spirit, and we are here in this body, and then we leave this body. And who else? Who knows this energy where it will go? I realize we are energy. God, call it divine intelligence, whatever you want to call it, however you conceive it. There is a power, and there's a source. Of everything that obviously is not us, even if we think or our ego thinks that this civilization is. There's more planets. There's more things that are out there. But I do know that every time I tap into my soul in my intuition, it's as if I was tapping to that source, to that oneness, which is in a way praying and preaching or whatever it is, but to myself. So I realized that instead of seeking outside the peace, the love, the better half. Etc. I started seeing inside me, and the more you see inside you, the more you start loving yourself. So when you start as a woman, especially as a woman, a relationship with yourself, then you stop competing because there's always going to be a younger, a better looking, a more intelligent woman, and you stop competing even within women. I said we have to empower ourselves as women. But it all starts with loving ourselves, and we have to accept ourselves with all of our traits. Isn't it interesting? Like I would never imagine myself a few years ago as an entrepreneur, hardcore entrepreneur, just interested in about playing the game of business, making money, and building more success. Talking to another fellow entrepreneur about spirituality, about soul, is something I had no interest in whatsoever in the past. Like religion, all this stuff, I had no interest in looking into. And I would imagine it's probably like similar to you, but like in this awakening, whatever triggers it, whether it's energy waves or a life path that is kind of all converging. Now we've got like a lot of other. Like-minded souls and entrepreneur, kind of like going through this journey together as well. I can't believe that we're talking about this conversation right now. It's amazing. I probably cannot even imagine you as a male, especially Asian, competing because just the fact that you admitted was like dishonorable. I mean, how could you admit that, right? Because for you, it was you had to show strength, no emotion. Everything's cool, right? Everything can fall apart, but you stay cool. So just the fact that you are also expressing it is huge to me as a male. I mean, I admire that because I always deal with men, and as a male, for you to admit that, my respects. Because especially, I don't see it. I mean, hats off. I have to put back my cool glasses on. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bulletproof. I need mine. <laughs> yeah. So wow. Like some of the things that I've started in my awakening journey. Like I've been to like Cancun. I think like three, four times, and、I、always loved the place as a holiday destination. But the more I looked into a lot of the ancient wisdom, a lot of them actually coming out from the Mayans, the Toltec, and the Aztec, and a lot of these names I have not heard of like in before this awakening period. But it's just cool to learn more about their practice. And how they came to be, 
again, similar things happen to them, to the culture, the traditions as the Australian Aborigine with the European settlement, I think it's more specifically the Spanish that came in, a lot of those things are lost. So we don't have the same wisdom that's being shared, at least in the common media, mass broadcast level, common education is so scarce in terms of like our understanding. It's not easy to find this knowledge. You're familiar with Guru Singh, right? With who? Guru Singh. Guru Singh, yes. Yeah. So Guru Singh, like I've known him for all these years of being the great Kundalini teacher. And every time I spend time with him, it's so down to have, I have so much fun enjoying learning from him. But yet, when I read his book recently about buried treasure, it talks about him going to Mexico, if I remember correctly, or New Mexico. And in the middle of nowhere, found this hidden tribe of Mexican that can basically communicate telepathically and they've been somehow Guru Singh had a near death experience early on in when he was 14 or something and they've been sending like signals to him and communicating to him on a regular basis and when he found this tribe he found out the people specifically the two people that was actually communicating to him all these years so, so these things are we will make a movie out of like someone that we know are actually experiencing these telepathic and communicating it from a spiritual perspective and not even in the same place that when you talk about flat earth and, and communication is, is so close it's almost like we are just starting to explore or rediscover what life is about like God is inside of each one of us and we've got all the power and the soul and all that so have you ever come across or have the interest of learning about the traditional the Aztec the Toltec a lot of the ancient wisdom has that kind of like been on your radar yes not only has been on my radar but the Mayans did not disappear what happens is religion came and the Spanish came so they built churches on top of their temples so they figured they're gonna go and they're gonna pray to their multiple gods, let's put the one in front and eventually they'll just go with it and become Catholic. So the next generations became Catholic, but you still find Mayans in the jungle that treasure certain belief system and certain practices and our law in Mexico, there's a law of usos y costumbres, which means that you respect certain traditions because of culture. So the different civilizations, the Aztec in the center of Mexico, the Toltec in the center of Mexico, the Sioux were not only in Arizona and New Mexico, but also in Mexico, because those that Guru Singh is referring to in New Mexico are like the people in Texas. There are four, five, six generations of that civilization because the border was different. It was Santana, our leader, that sold for peanuts to the United States, those states. So that's why when some Texans say we're Mexican and we're also American, but we've never left. So they never crossed the border. There's some that crossed the border, but there's some people in New Mexico, in Arizona, in Texas, and in California that never crossed the border because they are the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth generation of part of those Indians. What happens is now the border changed and now they happen to be American. But that was just because of history. So not only Guru Singh, but Wim Hof and a lot of them are going, they see in nature and they appreciate in nature what the elders in Alaska, what the ancestors are respecting. So basically it is knowledge and education that back then, instead of writing, they would pass it on by word, mouth and tradition. And that's how they would carry it with honor. So the medicines that you see from these ancestors, whether they are psychedelics, whether they are medicines that are in traditional big pharma medicines, but they have like 2% versus having the plant there that cures something. They knew how to handle them to cure, but because it was handed down by them. And they would have the intuition to understand who had what talent to designate in a community, okay, we believe that so-and-so has a talent to be the official next doctor of the tribe. And then they would all train them. Nowadays, we are learning that our passion, like you discovered that passion, 
our passion in reality normally is related to a lot of our talent. But the institutions and the way that we grew up, now it's changing, was you have to study A, B, or C according to this course. It was never really according to our talent. And we were always seeking the answers outside. So yes, I love, uh, my ancestors are from the north of Mexico, and in reality are the Tarahumaras, because my father was from Chihuahua border with El Paso, Texas. And the Tarahumaras are the ones that run the marathons with no shoes and that live in the caves. And a lot of ultra marathons have done that. That's why the Tarahumaras have the cheekbones. That's why I have those cheekbones. But my mom uh, had a background that was more European, part uh, German and part American. So I kind of came out as a mix like many of us. But I did tap into that ancestry and I sometimes go to rituals that are done here in the jungle, and I enjoy them a lot. Something is called temascal. Temascal is like an igloo. It comes precisely from the Nahuatl, which is the tribe of Mexico that was a nomad, and they would find a hut made of wood, and it is almost like going into a sauna. But they put volcanic rocks that they bring from other regions. They ask permission to Mother Earth And then they offer whatever it is that you are going to let go of, whether it's emotionally or physically. And it's basically you come together and you sweat and you sing and you listen and you come out renowned and it is absolutely amazing. That is one of the practices. So yes, they are remote, but they are more and more becoming not only experiences that we recognize and now admit proudly, But in different civilizations, not only in Latin America, because of the energy that's here, but also elsewhere, people are starting to admit that those are experiences that not only can be part now of your life, but they could also attract that awakening, not only of souls, but even the curiosity of people that now want to travel and want a different experience and not necessarily the commercial part of going to a resort. Wow. I um, When you spoke about your dad, somehow just a big wave of sensation just came off. I felt the injustice, it, the injustice that's, that's been done to a lot of the indigenous people. And can you just share just in case, um, like before I started waking up, I'm naive, I'm ignorant to what has been going on. And it's not just in Mexico, but around the world, but specifically to the Mexican culture, like, and from your own personal stories that you've heard from, whether it's your father, your grandparents, or, or people that you know, do you want to share from something that is different to just reading it from the internet, from the books, from somewhere, to hearing directly from you, someone that have, I guess, heard from generations being passed down. So what do you know about it? Some of the things that have to endure. Well, they endured so many things, uh, not only abuse, slavery. Because pr- prior to that, to my understanding, similar to the Aboriginal culture that like we and the land is cut as one and all the animals. And, and so everything is even before you, you have an animal, you ask for permission from the God, from the animals and which yeah. one is everything is about like even the rocks, everything is, is sacred. So everything is about respect. And yet I think within different within different tribes, there was war going on as well, was it? Yes, just like in Africa, just like there was in different tribes, there was war. And not because they were very intelligent and great civilizations, just like the ones in Egypt, etc. It means that they were perfect. They also had their issues mm. because they also had their social level. And for instance, when you come to Chichen Itza and you see in Tulum, not everyone had access. Mm. You had also that top 1% or top 5% that were the chosen as well to get certain information. So we can analyze and maybe also create criticize, which is true, all the injustice that has happened, but they also had certain belief systems that we may feel was unjust, like the Mayans used to play ball or play football, but if you won, you would be sacrificed, and it was an honor, and you wanted to be chosen. You raised your hand because that was your belief system. So nowadays, you're going to say, oh no, how dare they? So I think it all has to do with the belief system. So at that time, in their belief system, they felt that. They believed in sacrifice. Something that, for instance, I believe in what I've learned in history is that the only thing that I believe, as Erica Garcia, was good besides 
besides the good ham and the wine <laughs> from the Spanish that conquered us was the fact that they brought the actual porks from Spain. That pork, what it did is that allowed us to stop cannibalism because we would eat each other. Wow. Aztecs would eat each other. Wow. So it all has to do with your belief system. So, But that's me now because I'm thinking there's no way I would eat another human being. But how do I know the circumstances that they were in? So when we come to judging the injustices that come about today, and you and I know about this, there is more slavery than ever before. There's more than 15 million kids that are in slavery for sexual slavery. And we know about that through Operation Rescue that I knew before Tony Robbins came into it because Eduardo Verastegui, the producer of that Freedom movie, he was my friend before when he was unemployed because him being a sex symbol in Mexico from telenovelas and soap operas decided that he no longer wanted to act in any roles that had to do with his looks and with him. He was committed because he is a fervent Catholic and he was committed to only doing content that would benefit humanity. And that what that did is he ended up with no job for four years in LA. And then he meets Tim Ballard, which is the amazing soul, an American and seal that decided to live his drop his life to go in and save kids from this sexual slavery. And he said, oh my God, he invited him to see if he would see a movie that he had finally produced that was about a kid and inspiring. And he ended up partnering and now with Tony launching a movie called Freedom, Oper you know, Operation Freedom, that is geared to creating that awareness of something that no one wants to talk about, which is the fastest growing business, which is of course, you know, just having slaves that we thought it no longer existed and it exists today. So how far have we come? I don't know, but it doesn't mean it just changed labels or it changed hands, but it doesn't mean that when we find an injustice, we can't do about it. Instead of feeling bad about the injustice or choosing, at least that's my choosing of what they did to my dad's ancestors or etc. What I do is I respect and the person, I have a lot of people that work for me that are Mayans and they're allowed to talk in their Mayan if they have a something that they have to celebrate that is not an official holiday, they're allowed to go and do it. We learn from them, they speak Mayan and for the first time in history in our state, the constitution was translated in Mayan. Nice. Which for us, that was huge because they were never represented in court because they never understood what was happening in court. So they don't know what they were accused of and they couldn't defend themselves. So if they didn't have a good lawyer, then they didn't understand their rights. And now at least they have the constitution in Mayan. And, and that was thanks to the fact that the UN last year claimed that it was the official year precisely of the indigenous people worldwide. Wow. And thank you for sharing the story. It definitely reminded myself that in this world that we often use labels, like this person is good, like if someone committed certain crime, this person is a bad person. But let's, let's just say the person that committed the crime is just in that fraction of the moment, he did something that most people will regard as bad. But who's to say that lesson is not for us to wake up as a humanity. And throughout that person's life, I'm sure that he's done something good as well. So if you just apply a label for Yeezy summarization, that is a bad person, we're really oversimplifying it and just putting the wrong context on it. So even by saying that some of the things in the past is injustice, is wrong, it shouldn't have happened. But who's to say that in the divine universe, evolution saying that if cannibalism is happening, maybe it's saying, hey, this is not a perfect system. Let's kind of wipe it with something else, a new thing that came and hopefully it's going to be better. And if that doesn't work, let's change it to something else again. And we're constantly evolving, evolving. And, and I guess one thing that I've always learned from like Byron Katie and some of the other teachers is you can't argue with reality. If you argue with reality, you're going to be wrong 100% of the time. It is what it is. And Tony teaches this as well. The meaning that we give to it is up to us to give it the meaning. The minute that we feel that we are victimized, even though it's not me directly, but us as humanity, we've been victimized by certain cultures, certain, certain armies, certain elites or whatever, then we feel powerless. The minute that we move ourselves away from the victim mode and become like what you just said, empowered, 
then we are in a position to make change. Exactly. And reality is, at the, again, our perception of reality. Because maybe you look at it from your own meaning, your own background, your own past experiences, and I look at it from my own, and we're looking at the same thing. And then the I only has 10% of that reality because the rest is in the rest of our brain and it's perceived in different ways. So how do we know that this is square, this is flat, this is 3D. A great example is a picture. When you judge a picture and then they show you the picture, the other side of it, and then you see the other reality, you're like, oops, you were already judging this. But then there's always another angle. There's two, three, four sides of the same story. And it just depends on which angle you look at it from. So it's hard sometimes to be so neutral and so objective because of course things happen to us and we feel right? But what I've learned lately is that when you step out and if you're going to judge or if you're going to try to make an analysis, if you come out from a place of love, then the understanding and what comes out is much different than when you're just reacting. And that ability to act as an observer and analyze a bit more comes from that inner peace that comes from being a lot inside of yourself so that the rest of the day you are able to go about your life but still acting as if you were this observer versus reacting towards things that, that happen. You can still be yourself, have that essence, however your personality comes about, be yourself, but with this observer mode. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, in my experiences with the sacred plant medicine, I you talk about realities rather than reading from some books or hearing from some teachers about reality and, and oneness and all these different things. It's the first time I've experienced another reality that features as real, if not more real than the current 3D material world reality. And I think with the Toltec traditions and the Australian Aborigine, they actually call this the dream world like, or the waking dream. So what we call is real is actually a dream, but the way that the dream has been designed is designed so consistent. Whereas the plant medicine journey, a lot of the hallucinogenic, um, you may call it, is hallucination because how do you know it's real? It's always changing. But I know, I'm not trying to convince anyone, but I know that deep in myself that there are the other dimensions as the law of the ancient wisdom has talked about, as quantum physics is kind of alluding to, and everything comes back down to zero, zero point energy or zero point and come from nothingness, and, and we everything else is created. But this whole world, this whole reality we know that we feel is so real, what if all this is just part of a dream? And there's so many more dimensions, but it's, I'm not here to convince anyone because you can't be convinced anyway. But when you have one of these experiences, whether you meditate in the dark, the dark caves for like a week, seven days, and or you do some of the pasana meditation don't talk to anyone because a lot of the times that when using our five senses is getting all these distractions and signal some part of our brains is not it doesn't have a chance to crank to work it's almost like it needs that silence to quiet down the senses before it get activated so you say you spend some time in the jungle have you have you spent whether it is plant medicine or i know that some of the rite of passage or some of the ceremonies it can allow you to whether you enter into a portal or somehow have those some um, transcendental type of experiences beyond the current reality have you had those experiences i i haven't had from the point of view of transcending or entering a portal but uh, lorena a friend of mine from spain that is one of those persons is here now so i may meet her and, and she may talk Talk about those parallel uh, lives etc that we all are parallel levels that we have but what I did in the jungle is not eat so what I did is for health reasons which I nothing I just wanted to practice autophagy and reach that I didn't want to depend on food because I found that we are also codependent on food and we eat by emotion. Regardless if we're fat, fit, it doesn't matter. Many times we compensate with ice cream or et cetera, our emotions. And one thing that I learned from a teacher of mine that used to be uh, Mr. Mexico and he helped, he trained me 20 something years ago, but now has his own holistic approach to training, which is based on breathing and your own body, etc. He told me that he was sick of living in Tupperwares 
eating seven times a day because he had to keep the muscle. He was sick of it. So he went one time to just stop eating, of course, only drinking and doing this fasting, not for political reasons, not to gain anything, but it was just to claim his system. Instead of going to a spa and doing all that, he said, no, I'm just going to go. And he did it and it cleaned everything. So I said, I'm going to try to do it. And we were in lockdown and I said, why not? So they organized it in the jungle in a small eco lock. And I went there and I did not eat for 15 days. And we drink like, water? You, yes, of course. You drink water and it was water with a little bit of lime. And, uh, and that's all you did. And uh, at the beginning, the first 48 hours, you start wrestling with the idea, so I'm getting a bad mood, etc. But then every day we're teaching about our body. Today we're going to study our heart. How Today we're going to study our liver. Today we're going to... So, of course, I wrote a book of notes like that. But it was great because I thought, oh, in order to fast, I don't have to exercise. Well, we exercise. Nothing happened. Oh, in order to fast, I cannot act normal. No, it was also a um, limiting belief. I could do absolutely everything. I not only lost weight, but it was not about losing the weight. It was about learning to control the fact that we have this fixation that we have to have something in our mouth. And I learned that it was not necessary. And then I learned that in order to stay healthier, you eat less. But of course, media tells us we have to keep eating. The servings get bigger. You have to keep eating. It is the opposite of what the media is telling us. So when you learn to not only control that by conviction, not by a label of, oh, now let's be vegan. Now let's be pescatarian. Now let's be carnivore. Just by listening to your body again and your intuition. Am I hungry? Okay, I'll eat. But if I'm not hungry, why do I have to eat? Just because it's lunchtime? Then you also start having this relationship with your body. And that's the experience that I had in the jungle. And that's kind of like... Like part of our body sometimes, I wouldn't want to say it deceives us, but it's been trained to act a certain way. Just like you've learned from Wim Hof, like the cold and, oh, I feel the, the sudden urge of cold, I need to put a jacket on. But you can train yourself that, hey, it's no longer cold anymore. And just like when you say that it's hungry, you may have the urge, I need to eat. And yes, you are hungry. But because you've been tra conditioning yourself to eat at least three times a day at certain times. So when you're not eating at that time, the body feels that it's abnormal, it's sending a signal that, hey, you're missing the time slot. But um, if I've got friends, that's done the, the water diet before and I think they say like from maybe even the fifth or seventh day like around that mark you they describe that having even more energy than before exactly you have that low and then suddenly you have a lot more energy and you could keep going I could have kept going it's only that it ended but uh, but uh, uh, they have a program of 21 days and I said if I could do this now I could do the Vipassana because I talk a lot as, as you can see and hear and I said what am I going to do in that Vipassana experience who am I going to speak to now I know that I could do it I mean I don't know what will come about but it will be very interesting by being in myself completely in silence so that's something that I'm definitely going to do yeah and get a chance to really pay attention to your own thoughts because sometimes for a lot of people doing nothing and just being by yourself is the most difficult thing to do so that's why we whip out a phone like and call someone or social media or like just to keep ourselves busy exactly but uh, I at least I've learned to love myself a little bit and I'm on this path and it feels good because the more you love yourself, the less you need anyone else to complete you and the least you depend on others. It's not fair if I depend my mood or my happiness, which is not a destination, on the way my son treats me or if he pays attention to me and he's 27 or if my friends talk to me. Anything that I depend on is not healthy for me. I can only depend on myself and just be and just let life happen. And it doesn't mean I don't have goals or I, I am not, I don't have a direction, but at least I'm enjoying the process. And then something happens, I surrender to the experience and I go with the flow. And usually amazing things happen out of that. What you said is one of the more, most profound, I wouldn't say most, but definitely one of the more profound um, things that I have learned in relationship. like. Yes. And again, you, you triggered me to think about the first time I've heard about the Toltec. It was from this book, Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. Um, and it talks about, agreement. yeah, he's, he wrote the same book as well. So he's also wrote another book, The Mastery of Love. And it talks about that, yeah, like you just 
can't get love from other people like the, the society the western or even the eastern society doctrine to think that you complete me i need yeah. someone to complete me or even your kids to complete you or your friends to complete you no like that is so wrong or in the world that we've been brought up with consumerism we need the cars the luxury items the clothing the certain brand name to complete us all of this is the farce is an illusion that's leading us further and further away from the truth but what you just said you need to complete yourself and all the inner work of being quiet and being hearing yourself and challenging yourself of you know i'm feeling the cold i'm feeling hungry and and transcending beyond that like these are just feelings i don't need to react to them i can like the traditional most people say you've cold you don't wear a jacket you're gonna get catch a cold but yourself and Wim Hof, all these other people have defined even when you say if you don't eat for like 15 days you're gonna starve you're gonna get sick but again you define what the traditional notions of thinking that, that this is what's gonna happen so i think a lot of the things um that you've brought up is so solid it really helps us in what the real world what we need to awaken to some of the ancient wisdom that's been around to rediscover what they are yes because probably our intuition knows that we're already complete we just have to be aware of it because if we don't believe it then we're sending the wrong signal to our mind to our bodies and then we behave according to our beliefs so the first thing we have to do is, is become aware of that and appreciate it and then life will just flow <laughs> you know when you talk about your business then when you talk about life principles and the spirituality some of these things you speak with different energy interesting when you talk about business it's almost like a square shape that's this edginess this hardness straight line like about it and this is the way it is whereas when you speak about the spiritual style and, and life you speak with this flow almost like the ocean the yin and the yang and I didn't notice it. I have to uh, listen to this podcast later so that I could now be the observer and understand it. Thank you for that observation. I didn't notice it. But thank you. When I listen to this, I will make sure that I pay attention to that. Yeah, it's almost like the business. It's almost like if I was to choose a, a subject, it's like maths. One plus one equals two. It just is. It's a matter of fact. And, and so when you speak, it's like it's, this is how it is. But when you talk about life and spirituality, you talk. it's almost like art. You, you're painting something and there's never an end to to your knowledge to your wisdom or it is perfect or imperfect you just you're just painting wow i don't know how to paint but if it sounds like painting i love you're it painting, you're painting with your words with your flow i love it i love it so i'm curious um as a mother as having a son growing up i guess for a big part of your life as a hardcore entrepreneur um success success make money and more success and always do 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 and let's let's hustle let's do more to reawaken a part of you that is everything is perfect even if you just sit here by the ocean and enjoy the sun enjoy our breath and just be and just appreciate and gratitude how have you tried to embody your life view with your son or, or share with him or do you just like it's his life he'll find his own path like what is the approach that you've taken i changed my approach i've changed my parenting skill three times in my life uh when he was an adolescent i went from compensating and feeling guilty because i was always working so much to setting limits then i went back to pushing him and giving him all the tools so that he could strive and i put him and when i say i put him is i made the effort of providing opportunities for him to be in different stages internationally so that he could not only gain an international education, but relationships and different uh, points of view. And it worked because when he came back from studying abroad, he not only brought back friends from around the world and an opportunity of an education abroad, not as an exchange student with certain limits, but of course with limits according to my budget, but from being in an education in Switzerland and then in England with a different economy me than mine and I was very proud of it and I did it with a lot of effort but my intention was like Tony Robbins that if you always compete in this little stadium then how do you know I want him to raise the standard and I didn't want him to raise the standard from the point of view of society I wanted to raise him standards from the point of view of having a friend from Kazakhstan a friend from Saudi Arabia a friend from from Latin America as well and a friend from Europe and now I sometimes have friends here that are 
come from years ago and sometimes he goes and visits a friend somewhere around the world and that value is incredible because just the friendships and understanding that people are different and accepting that and then learning that as a single son he is not the center of attention and the world does not revolve around him he was able to understand and those qualities even though he had to spend time alone and of course I wasn't with him brought him back certain abilities where he now learned at 19 that he wanted to be an entrepreneur and he started his own business and he failed for a while and then sold that and then started another one when he was successful and then it was his idea to start the foundation that we have he was the first one to implement especially the sports section because he used to be a, a footballer and now he's a leader in the community and he became the youngest congressman in Mexico and he's the president of Congress of our state and uh, and he's 27 he barely turned 27 so I'm very proud of him and now I see that putting him in uncomfortable positions and that everything that he learned the good and the bad was worth it so I now accept the fact that I had my of course my mistakes but that I also had good decisions and that there's no book that tells you how parenting is supposed to be but I see that he's doing something that he's passionate about which I care about that because I didn't want him doing something because of the money I want especially millennials I wanted him doing something that he was passionate about what is he passionate about politics and he said mom I learned that you and I started the foundation and yes we help people but there's never enough money there's never enough fundraising and he says we're not changing any laws but if I'm inside Congress I could change certain laws and I can make a difference and I said wow if that's what you believe in because I could never be in politics because yeah. I say what I believe in and I would probably be politically correct all the time but he has that nerve and that self-control of that emotion that he needs to be there and he's a great leader and I'm like whoa so I'm like okay good for him at least he's going so when I say he has his path is I am no longer most of the time because others I still am acting as a codependent where I am depending on if he's okay, then I'm okay. If he's or chasing him, are you all right? Are you hungry? Do you need this? Do you need that? Because he always lived abroad when he was studying. So after being seven years abroad and he came back here and I was traveling, it was like him being alone at home. And in these times, we were together and we're both very intense and we're both very similar in certain things in terms of energy. So of course we would clash in certain things. So it was very interesting because we came to the conclusion that we love each other, but that it's time for him to find his own apartment, not now from, from studying and he's getting re He's in love. He may want to marry or not. I don't know, but it is time now for him to leave. And, and we decided that together and it came about from this relationship because from being together, Together again he was leading the house and I was like well but it's my house <laughs> and it's our house but I also lead so it's very interesting because it was this two type a personalities leading a home one working in one angle the other one working in that angle I had my zooms he had his zooms mine were important so I had a lower as you can see I talked loud but then his were important and he was in Congress so it was very interesting so down the hallway there was Congress this way, this was promoting Cancun. It was so funny. So the dynamic change, and that was just a great conclusion. Yes, we were together. We had very deep conversations and we also clashed in many ways, but it all came about great because we realized it was time again for us to go in our own path together, maybe even as neighbors, but each in their own space. <laughs> so this is a great segue into, you say we're all going our own path. What is the next chapter in store for um, Erica Garcia? I don't know. What I want to do now is just stay healthy, happy and strong. I want to uh, continue to consolidate the new ways of the low touch economy, which is from our point of view is the way that I'm going to touch your heart and someone else's heart so that I could trigger them to come visit us so we're learning how to do that virtually so that we're able to entice you to travel and give you the health certainty that it'll be okay to come here that you will be safe and keeping that which is my passion and then I formed a company called gratitude in a gift
gift. And I love that because it is geared towards women entrepreneurs. And it is in English for anyone that speaks English. And what I want is I want it to be a platform so that like Awaken the Entrepreneur, that platform provides tools that women can use to lead their groups of people, meaning collaborators, employees, etc. And I want them to understand that if they are entrepreneurs, they also have the ability to decide to not necessarily multitask all the time. It's okay to delegate. It's okay to take care of yourself. And it's okay to adopt the virgin and the sapos philosophy of taking care of your employee. Because if you control, not control, but if you are change the culture of your company or your collaborators and they're able to work together and they're able to feel appreciated and you are able even to suggest to them to go on a holiday and or to grow or to experience what you've just described, you know, of certain experiences, they will grow. And the more that you allow them to try transform within your organization. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, going up the ladder of your company, but the more that you add value to their lives, the more they'll appreciate you, they'll stay in the company. And especially if they're allowed to be themselves, then they can also go and experience incredible things. Thanks to the fact that you allowed them to, or that you brought that to the company or that you introduced them to those experiences. So I want to have that platform to provide those tools first to the niche market of small business women in California and then Latinas and American and then grow it if possible. And if people want to find out more about it, is there a website or social media that they can follow? Thank you so much. It's called gratitudeinagift.com. They could register their email or they can find it in Instagram. It's starting and uh, let's see where that goes. I've put some energy in building that myself because I was always I would just hire a company and say, and I would just provide orders, do this, this, this. But these times of the COVID, what I did is I built it myself. And when I really was like, oh, I can't do it, or I don't know how to do this because I'm dyslexic, then I would ask my team, help me at 3 a.m. in the morning, please help me. I don't know how to do this. So it was very interesting. It was like going back to school and it was great. It was very uncomfortable, but it was well worth it. And from a personal level, if someone wanna follow you or get in touch with you, like are you on social media? Yes, in Facebook, I'm as Erica Garcia. And in Instagram, I am Erica with the K Cancun. Awesome. And one last question. If you were the world president or something that you could make a wish or change something, what would that be? That's a very, very, very hard question. Well, first, I would like to solve the basic thing of Maslow's, which was, you know, hunger. I can't believe that we want to go to other planets and we have the capacity to go to orbit. I mean, I love that. And we can't solve world hunger because of logistics and politics, because at the end of the day, sometimes the food is there waiting and it is stopped at certain borders just because there is corruption etc so i would want to solve that first i got caught up in the moment i find it hard to believe when as soon as you said i want to solve hunger when you said the word hunger my stomach created a hunger noise the, the tummy started rumbling throughout the whole entire hour plus like it did not make a single sound and because it's just quiet in the room it's just when you said the word hunger i don't know whether the energy was felt it's almost like I felt the real hunger at the same time. But yeah, that will be a great cause. And I think from all the research and all the stuff that I've heard, we've got more than enough food to solve that already. It's just about the distribution and some of the logistics issues. So let's um, set our intention and see that happening within the next, I don't want to say the next few years, even the next, the next few moments. Thank you so much for giving your time and sharing so much wisdom. And I really appreciate our chat and learning so much from you. No, Gary, I learned from you and thank you for your smile for creating this Awakening Entrepreneur podcast and for being open to interviewing women and men from all over the world and from all walks of life. I wish that we celebrate together more than a thousand episodes and make sure that you also share that with me so that I'm able to also introduce you to my community. I would love to. Thank you so much. Gracias. 
Okay, I've stopped the recording. Thank you so much. That was so cool. Thank you, Gary. It was amazing. Thank you. You are a great interviewer. You ask interesting questions. Very interesting. You have a wealth of knowledge in many, many different variety of topics. Thank you. My my English, you know, is a bit, but but I that doesn't matter. I hope I was able to.、Uh, no, I love the accent. It is perfect, and I, I love that every so often you threw some Spanish word and I didn't understand, but it, it sounded really great. Thank you. Make sure that you share it with me and with us and with Marifer, so we're able to also share it. Yeah, fantastic. I'll probably get this edited and it'll be ready sometime next week, and I'll share it with you and I'll share it with the awakened community as well. And hearing from your story, thank you so much. And yeah, anything you need, anything. Anytime you want to chat, do reach out, and I'm glad that all these years of seeing your name pop up on Facebook, I finally get to meet you at least face to face, and I'm sure one day we'll meet in person as well in this lifetime or the next. Yeah, sure we will. Okay, love you. Take care. Yes, yes. Thank you. Bye bye.